Shalom Aleichem. Um, on this day of Yom HaShoah, Yiddishkeit Initiative is doing what we should all be doing on this day. Um, remembering, respecting, honoring the fighters and friends, relatives, and the entire community that was devastated and decimated and nearly destroyed by the Holocaust. As artists, what we do is we honor and remember with our work, our songs, our words. <sighs> My name is Eleanor Risa. In 1995, I wrote a monologue for a man, imaginary, yet one that I knew very well. A man who fought to live through the days and years of the Shoah and afterwards. I wrote it because I saw that I saw that part of the future. I saw in my mind the part where those people would no longer be around, those people who lived through the Holocaust. Much of my family lived through the Holocaust. Much of my family did not live through the Holocaust. This is a monologue that this piece you're going to see today is a monologue about the last one. May we continue to remember and respect and try to make this world a place where such a horrible thing cannot happen to anyone ever again, not to any culture, not to any religion, not to any race, no one. I want to very much tell you how grateful I am to Yiddishkeit Initiative, who is producing this reading, and they provide so much for us for free. It's pretty amazing, but we all know nothing is for free. So if you have a couple of shekels or a couple of thousand <laughs> shekels around to show your support and encourage their work, that would be great. And I want to thank Amy London and Eloisa at Yiddishkeit Initiative. And more than anything, I want to thank my friend and colleague, Avi Hoffman, who uh, tirelessly runs the organization and who I'm grateful will be appearing in my play this afternoon or evening whenever you're watching it. Epilogue. The last one, an epilogue. The stage is empty. An elderly man, ageless and vital, enters to a smattering of applause and flashbacks. <clears throat> hello, hello. Just a minute. Look, maybe you have a mistake. I know it's crazy. You got to admit, impossible that it's me who's the last one. The last one. The very last one. But there's no one else. Maybe you haven't looked hard enough. Yeah, that must be it. The people are still hiding. You, you know, it wasn't that long ago, the war. And maybe there's people in such good hiding places that they themselves don't know that the war is over already. It's possible. Yeah, I remember reading an article in the Times. Oh, oh sure, I read the Times every day. Every day, even on Shabbos. Ah, what do I give a damn about religion? A bunch of lousy hypocrites. I don't pay no attention to it. Except for Yisker and Yom Kippur. That's the memorial prayer for the dead. For that I go, but that's it. The rest is baloney. Yeah, the newspaper is also full of baloney, but don't worry. I know how to read between the lines. I, I like that William Sapphire, even though he's a lousy Republican. And I also like that Rosenthal fella who writes sometimes on the back page. But that Anthony Lewis, a big anti-Semite, I'm telling you, 
By him, Israel is always in the wrong. No matter what they do, he knocks them down. It's not right. I'm not saying they're perfect. They're stupid too. But they can't always be wrong. Yeah, he doesn't know history, period. He talks from today like a moron, a joke. You can't talk about now without knowing the history. Look, I, I'm not a college graduate like most of the Americans, but I'm no dummy. I had to leave public school after the sixth grade to help my father. But I got common sense. All your college education is nothing if you ain't got no common sense. Am I right? Anyhow. What the hell was I talking about? Uh, don't worry, I don't have Alzheimer's. I'm just an alte kake. That means an old shit. Listen, don't think it's such a bargain getting old. It's plenty lousy. But I'll tell you the truth. I do watch myself. I, I had a scare with my heart a couple of years ago. I cut out smoking four years already. Sure. Yeah, I smoke two packs a day. For what? Almost 60 years? Camels, of course, without the filter. Come on. But I cut them out. Cold turkey. Also, I cut out butter, sugar. Sugar I never liked anyway. Meat. Ah, now that's a problem. Damn it the hell. There is nothing like a big, juicy veal chop, you know, broiled with some garlic, or a nice shell steak about two inches thick. Ooh, I order it special from the butcher. I tell you, I make it better than by Peter Luger. How the hell can you give that up? Come on. The whole cholesterol business is a bunch of baloney anyway. Genius doctors, lousy bastards. Every week they come up with a new scare and a new idea for the cure. Yeah, it's a racket. They make a fortune. Don't think I don't know. But what the hell? I try to watch anyway, just in case they're right. Can you imagine? I still think about a smoke every now and then. I'm lost. Oh, yeah, I was saying about an article in the paper, in the Times, about a Japanese fella that was hiding in a cave 30, 40 years after the war. The guy was so well hidden, he didn't know it was finished. I'm not joking. He didn't know. So, maybe there's people yet like him who don't know the war is over. Jewish people, huh? possible no no all right look until they find someone else i'll be the last one the last dinosaur you know there's a yiddish word for dinosaur it's dinosaur no that's not a joke i mean it it's a terrible thing what happened you know, people think that Yiddish is just a bunch of jokes, words to make you laugh, pot, schmock, schmendrick. No, are you crazy? Yiddish was the language of the world. Wherever you went, to any European city or town, you would manage in Yiddish. In Asia, too, physicists, scientists spoke Yiddish in their laboratories. And it wasn't just the schmatte salesmen and the yentes. It was the architect and the archaeologist, the businessman and the brain surgeon, everything, all subjects, all professions, everything, anything, literature, poems, beautiful words, expressions. You have no idea. Even sex was in Yiddish. But that was from right to left. Nah, that's just a joke. <laughs> Sex in Yiddish. Oh boy, this. This I can remember. Listen, listen, I may be old, but I ain't that old. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Making love to a girl in Yiddish this is one of the sweetest pleasures on the earth. But you look at me and you think, what the hell can this Alte Kake know about sex? 
Come on. Let me tell you. I was once a something. A something. I can speak eight languages and I'm not bragging. Handsome. Even though I'm a short fella. And look at these eyes. Ah, ah. Magnets. <laughs> I looked on the girls and I made electricity. I was the Thomas Edison from my town. Sure. So, if I tell you that being with a girl, kissing and hugging and talking Yiddish is the greatest thing, you can believe me. Don't let these looks deceive you. I'm no pisher. I've been with girls from all over the world, all over, even with two girls in one bed. No joke. And none of them, not one, not the prettiest beauty even, was as loving and warm as the plainest girl could be in Yiddish. <laughs> ah. Those words, they go straight to the heart, straight like an arrow. The souls grab each other, I'm telling you. It combines the love from a mother with the honey cake from the baker, and then you mix in uh, some sex, and boy, oh boy, that's living. Can you believe it? <laughs> Unbelievable. And the laughing and the fun. <laughs> Not like today. We made our fun from nothing, from each other. It was plenty. It was... It was another world. And now, you try not to think about it. You try to, to drop your skin like a snake and go on. But you know, it's not so easy like those lousy snakes make it look. You miss it. You, you just got to try not to think about it. That's all. Look, it was a rotten time. When you think about it, really, come on, forget it. All the Fakakta Jews like to remember the shtetl like it was a picnic. Oh, the good old days, baloney. It was always rough there, before the war even. Yeah, I remember I had to run to school because the Polish boys would chase me and hit me. Big anti-Semites, I'm telling you. The Polacks were bigger anti-Semites than the Germans. I know you don't believe me, but it's the truth. The Germans were one thing, but the Poles? Oh, we lived among them, with them. We worked with them. They were our neighbors. The Nazis just did to us, but the Polacks didn't have the brains to do themselves. Come on, why do you think most of the concentration camps were in Poland? Because there especially... They didn't give a shit for the Jews. Look, there were, there were some good Polacks too. I'm not saying no. It's just that most of them always hated us. Always. You know, when I came out from the concentration camp, I was wandering Poland like a Michigan, looking for my family, friends, somebody. Months, years, we roamed crazy, wild. You have to remember what we lived through. Even though we fought like animals to survive, we never thought that we would ever really get the hell out of there. You know, try to picture for one lousy minute what it was like. It wasn't real, even to us. Even though we lived through it, it, it was unimaginable. Anyhow, I, I went to my hometown, to my father's house. Inside was now living a Polak, a man who knew my father, who sometimes worked with my father, living in my father's house, and he wouldn't leave. Can you imagine? He wouldn't leave? He said it was his house now, and that's that, his house. I am telling you, I killed him. I killed him. I, I, I ran at him, and, 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 and I, I hit him, and I strangled him, and, and, and I threw him out the window, and he ran away. Listen, the house was nothing for me without my father. I couldn't stay there alone. 
I had to find somebody. But I'll tell you, I don't regret for a minute that I beat the hell out of that guy, that bested. So I left there. You know, you couldn't go nowhere without papers, and that took time. Then I got my papers. I had no money, no food, no nothing. Remember, when I came out from the camps, I weighed less than 40 kilo. That's about 80 pounds. Till I put some flesh back on my bones. Ah, big deal. You know, the main thing was to find somebody not to be alone. Every town had a list of the survivors, the refugees who came through town with their destination. And you would look on the list to see if someone from your family was there and where they were going. Can you imagine this? You can't. Looking for names on lists together with thousands, thousands of other names for our life to see who was living. You would see a name, you know? You would see a name that you know. Is it possible that they're alive? No, no, it was all impossible, but we did it. That's what we did. We went from town to town, asking, looking, hoping. Finally, in one town, I saw my cousin's name on a list. I didn't know what to do first. I'm telling you, to look down on all the names, to come to a name, you know, family, friend, it means that you yourself, is living. Otherwise, you are a ghost walking on the earth alone, a shadow. I learned my cousins were in a town about 30 kilometers away. I stole a bicycle, and I'm telling you, I was lucky not to get caught and thrown into a jail. I got to the town. I remember I, I didn't know exactly where to go. I left the bike. And I started walking down the street. It was very muddy, a dark, cloudy day. I'll never forget this. I'm walking, walking. I see a man across the street from me, walking the other way, skinny like a noodle. I give a quick look. Something is familiar. I look, I look. He's looking at me also. <gasps> oh, my God. God, my God, it's my cousin, Ichi, Ichi, who was strong like a bull and soft like a king, a giant. Now he's pale and thin like paper. I wouldn't recognize him except for his whiskers. Yeah, he always had a pair of vonces, you know, viscous, like, like strong bristles, thick like an Italian peasant. I found him. Itche! I yelled to him. He saw me. He was white, like a ghost. And we grabbed each other and hugged and kissed and cried in that street, full of the mud. So look, I, I, I got goose pimples now even. Yeah, I was never so happy to see anyone in my life, except maybe the American soldiers who liberated the camp, or they came to us like from a movie, real heroes. To this day, I am crazy about the American soldier. Unbelievable. Yeah, Itchy and his wife, Laiche. They weren't in the camps. They escaped to Uzbekistan during the war. They had hunger, typhus, don't worry, they suffered plenty. But she looked on me, Laiche. Nobody ever looked on me like that with such, such pity and sorrow. She was shocked. I tell you, I myself, had no idea how much I changed. I didn't know. I thought it was still me. Yeah, that's a funny thing about a person, huh? They think of themselves a certain way, and even after they go through death and hell, they still think that they're the same person as from before. Yeah, it's like when the old people eat ice cream cones. 
you know, to them, it's like they're still 10 years old and they're trying not to let it drip and make a mess on their hands. Huh? But when we look on them, we see an old man with false teeth and dyed hair who doesn't know who the hell he is anymore. <laughs> Itch and light yeah, We talked about who was living and who we hadn't heard about and there was still plenty we didn't know yet. As it turned out, there was no one else left. Yeah, not my six brothers, not my baby sister, of course, not my parents, not my father's brothers or sisters or nieces or cousins. What? 30, 50, 100 people. Look, what is there to say about that? What can I tell you? That we cried? What do you want me to say? I was the only one left then. And here you tell me I am the only one left now? Come on. That's not what I wanted. I'm here by myself again. No, no, God damn it. Go away. I don't know a goddamn thing. Bring out the professors and the writers. Let them talk about it. I should have eaten the goddamn butter and the steak and the fried potatoes and the hell with the cholesterol. I didn't survive in order that I would be the last one, the only one left, all by myself, again. Why, you think being here with you is such a picnic? I'm, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. I know that. Of what use can I be to you, huh? The last one to remember the trains and the roundups and the hiding and the hunger and the killing. That's what you want to hear about. So what? Uh, look, this is plenty documented already. All the death. Whoever doesn't know this or believe this, I couldn't help them. They should drop dead. You don't need me for that. To be the witness of the death. You know, there's enough garbage already from during the war. Pictures, books, television shows even. Yeah, I didn't watch that show, that television show, The Holocaust. Even though I liked her, that girl, that, that Tova Feldshow. Oh, it's a nice name. She's a talented girl. But I still couldn't watch it. It's good that they made it, but it wasn't for me. You know, that Spielberg movie too. I'm sure it was very good, but not for me. It's for the rest of the Americans. You know what I read in the Times a couple of months ago? I couldn't believe it. They did a survey, and it showed that 35% of the American people don't believe that the Holocaust really happened. 35%? And this is an educated country? What the hell is that? I mean, what is that? What, you, you want me to go on a talk with a megaphone and tell people? Just put me in the zoo. Come on. Yeah, that's as bad as if it was happening again. What the hell is the point then, huh? I'm here and I'm the last. And then what, huh? Who will remain then? Who will stand up and say, I saw it. I lived it. It was real like day and night, huh? Not me. It won't be me. No, sir. So, who will it be? Huh? Who is left to protect the truth, the memory of these people, to watch it shouldn't happen again? Huh? You. It'll be left with you. Psh, what a job, boy. I feel sorry for you. You'll be left with it, with the tragedy and the shame and the guilt and the rage and the loss. Oh, boy. That'll be some loss that we're not here no more. Oh, boy. And then you'll be all alone. You'll go to your Fakakta oral history tapes, but it won't be the same. It'll be like looking at the dinosaur bones in the museum. It won't be the same no more. The eyes, the insides of the people, the boobers and the zaydas and the children and the cripples and the artists and the singers and the writers and the beggars will all be missing. The people 
finished. You didn't know them. And now there'll be no one to ask, to even tell you of them, who saw them and knew them and touched them. It'll be an empty hole. I feel sorry for you. <clears throat> My God, you know what? I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I don't believe it. I'm just now discovering something, something that I never thought for even a minute in my whole life. I'm a lucky guy. Me. Can you imagine? Lucky. I don't mean because I survived. Come on. A dog can survive. No, no. I mean because I was there. I saw it with mine own eyes. I saw the people, the world of the Jewish people living together, fighting together, and dying together. And the beauty of them, the sound of their laugh and their prayers and the feel of their skin and the tragedy from their tears, I saw them. I knew them. They were rich like kings, not with money. No, I don't mean money. Money is garbage. They were rich with character, and brains, and dignity, and charm. They were generous souls. Listen, most people didn't have nothing. Nothing. Whole families lived in one room. We slept four or five to our bed, head to feet. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would sleep with my head at one end of the bed and my brother Felix would sleep next to me, but his feet were by my head. And then my little brother Moshe would sleep next to Felix and, and so on. I don't know if you ever slept like this, but let me tell you, first of all, it was fun. And second of all, we stayed warm and we slept good. And furthermore, if I had all the money of Nelson Rockefeller and, and Ross Perot put together, I would give it away in a second, in a second, just to have one night back with my brothers in the bed. <laughs> let, let me ask you something. After me, who are you going to look at? Whose accent are you going to laugh at? Who's going to remind you of the people who should be here with you now, talking to you, cooking for you, kissing you? It's yet another living chapter of human history that's finished. Finished. Like the Civil War. The Indians, it won't be real. The books will get dusty and you'll forget who you came from. What a shame. You know, I think you lost more than me. It's a funny thing. Can you imagine? I don't feel angry no more. <laughs> what a change. I'm telling you, ask anybody who knew me. Maybe the first time in my life, I don't feel angry. I feel happy. Go no, <laughs> I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. You can't imagine. You, you know, there's a Yiddish expression. As men leipt, der leipmen. If you live long enough, anything is possible. Huh? How do you like that? <laughs> okay, so I, I'm here. I guess it's all right. Listen, if there is something you want to know, I think now is the time to ask me.
I, I would love to uh, thank Avi, and I, I did start my video. I'm starting my video. There's my video. Um, Avi, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And um, I, I, would you like to come on back, Avi, if you, if you're available, <clears throat> we'd like to. I'm back. I'm back. It was beautiful, <laughs> Avi. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be back. Yeah, it's you know, it's not easy. No, no, it's not easy. No, it's not supposed to be easy, but right. it, it's it's a huge undertaking, sir. Yeah. There's a lot of uh a lot of you know, avent you know, slaloming like down a ski slope, back and yeah. forth, Ahin and Ahea. Yeah. No, it's such a beautifully written piece, Elle. Thank you. I got to tell you, I mean, you know, and I'm trying to be objective now just as an actor to be able to take these words and bring them to life in a way that, and under your direction, I was able to find things that weren't necessarily my instinct, my instincts. You know, very often... I find myself wanting to find the sentimental side of these things because I, I'm removed from it a little bit. You know, I'm not a survivor. I am 2G, like you. And so when I look at the things my father went through in Auschwitz, I see, I feel the sadness. I feel the hurt and the pain. But when my father, and we talked about this when we were working on this, when my father told his story in his testimonial for the Shoah Foundation, there was no emotion at all. And it, it's stunning to watch someone telling the story of arriving in Auschwitz and having it told from such a totally objective perspective without any emotion. We got off the train, they opened the doors to the boxcars, and then they took us out and then they separated us. I watched most of my family go to that side and I was young, so they took me to this side. And then some of these guys who were Canadians came up, they called themselves Canadians because of different reasons they weren't really from canada and they came up to me and they said hey you see the smoke coming up from that chimney well that's your family that's going to be your family so then we and then he just tells the story and it's very hard for me as a 2g but as an actor i you led me there to be able to tell the story a little bit more factual a little bit more detached well, because of course we know in a way as actors that what moves, what moves people, is when you struggle against the emotion and when the, I'm I moved by your stoicism, by your strength. If, if your job is to tell the story, look, you know your father cried plenty. You yes. know, and your character. The, the last one says to what should I tell you? We, we, that we cried? Yeah, we cried. We cried. Big deal. Big deal, right. sissy. You know, you're so, we, was, we, we cried. And, and that's how they could live. Um, yeah. So. And it's not like, you know, when I was a child, <clears throat> When I was a very young boy, <clears throat> the most difficult thing that I ever had to do on the weekends, my father worked. He built a business, he was a computer guy, and he built a, a rather large company. So during the week, I rarely saw him. He was gone early, early in the morning. He didn't come back till late, late at night. So really, it was the weekends when I got to see my father. And my mother would say to me, Go wake up your father. And that was the scariest thing 
that I ever had to do as a child. Because inevitably, my father would have nightmares. He didn't cry, you know, he never talked about it, he never told the stories, you know, I never saw him cry. But when I had to wake him up, he would wake up screaming in tears. And it always scared the hell out of me. So, you know, it's, it's amazing how the human, you know, the human being deals with these things. Yeah. And I love how you wrote him. He's obviously not my father, but my father is in him. You know, there are so many survivors that I know and you know, I'm sure, who are in this script, who are, you know, this guy, whoever he might be. And the way you wrote him to be able to tell the story, I find so, you know, so, so profound and so honest. And the question you raise, which I really think is where I want to take the conversation ultimately, is, yeah, then what? So, you know, it's not today, it's not tomorrow, thank God. And hopefully it'll be a very long time from now. Well, before... but it won't be, Avi. I mean, it won't be a very long time from now. Right, I mean, but there you are... Can, you right. can hope it won't be a very long time from now, but it won't be a very long time. It'll be soon. Right, but there are those who were, you know, the child survivors who were very young when it started, the ones like, you know, who went to the kinder transports and stuff like that. Um, you know, there are those who were young. So, you know, in the best case scenario, but they don't really remember much. They, you know, some of them were old enough story. to... story. I mean, the kinder transport was a different story. Right, right I understand. But no, I'm and I'm not, I'm not minimizing what you're saying. Yes, I, I, I hope the day never comes or something. I mean, well, but that's, but, not but really that's, how, that's right. how it is. And right. except, I mean, if we look at um, Black Lives Matter and the issue of slavery, which was longer ago, right. um, and mm -hmm. somebody says their great-grandmother, this is the pencil that she, you know, that they, this is the right. cotton, this is, and you, it's the generation's job. Right. It's our job to yeah. remember. And there was a last slave. There was know. a last slave, there but was. I guess there, and there was a child of a last slave. Right, but right. now there's an anical. And the great Ure Niklach and Ure Niklach and Ure Niklach, right? And the story continues. Yes, and and uh, you know. But unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, in the United States of America, we don't teach the slavery lessons, you know, as well as we should in terms of the public school system. No, the stories no. are still told. The yes, museums yes, no. have been built, and and the books have been written. But what are we going to do after our last one? You know, it's a, it's a, such an interesting dilemma. I mean, I personally, um, I mean, I work in the theater and I am in the show business. But if you said to me, do you want to spend a couple of months going into classrooms? Right. That, I, that's how I feel. Put, give me a megaphone and put right. me in the zoo. Right. And I can do that. I will do that. Boy, you know, we this, have a lot of comments on Facebook, man. We have a lot of beautiful commentary. Um, you know, a lot of beautifuls. Somebody who knew my father said Mendel Huffman was gross. Thank you, Shoshana. Uh, all the survivors that I met told their stories factually. Cannot think of one that didn't, says Nina. Um, we have to remember, continue the stories, never forget. Bravo, Eleanor. There's a lot of bravos in here, Eleanor. Um, and so, you know, it's nice. It's very You know, nice. I'm doing this podcast, uh, Yale University's Fortunoff Video Archive, Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust. And, you know, nearly everyone is deceased. And... Right people tell their stories. And 
and they tell them, you know, they heart, sometimes they can't talk. Sometimes they, 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 they catch themselves right. in a way. Right. They, they, they're prepared to go on. They're prepared to say that they were in hiding for two years and they didn't eat or pish or sleep or whatever. And, but every once in a while it grabs them. Right. And, um, I'll tell you a, 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 a tiny anecdote of we were recording recently this second season. And I mean, I'm pretty inured or so I think. And there was a, a woman's story. And at the end of it, I had to say, well, so-and-so uh, died uh, in November 7th, uh, 1998. And she has survived... And, I, and it gets me now, too. She is survived by her four children, 12 grandchildren, and 45 great-grandchildren. And I'm finished. Right. I'm, that finishes me. Not that she was in Auschwitz. Not that she was on the death march. Not that. No. That, right. she, that she leaves the world with 48 great-grandchildren. That lays me out. Right. And uh, that... And, and and in a way, you know, this pandemic, not that we can compare apples to oranges, but you just have to stay alive. And that's the victory. I mean, you know, that's what my father and my mother always used to say, is that that was the victory, that, we, that they survived to have children and grandchildren and that there are more. That is the great victory over Hitler. The problem, of course, is... Had those six million lived, there would have been a hundred million Jews in the world today. And instead, we're only now starting to get back to the numbers that we were at before the war. And that's the tragedy, of course. That's the greatest tragedy of all this, is that it's taken us till now to just rebuild the numbers of what we had before the war. Um, you know, there's something, you know, uh, fascinating that I've heard about. I don't know if you've heard about it. I know that the, the Spielberg Foundation, you know, the Shoah Foundation, of course, has all the videos. As, and, as does the Fortune Off Video Archive. I right. Know. And the Fortune Off Video Archive. And, they and, they and do. Look. Yes. Right. And they've shared, you know, what Shoah has done is shared their videos with, you know, with uh, Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Museum and all the, uh, you know, concentration camp museums, um, which is great. But here's where I'm going with this. So apparently they have developed artificial intelligence that allows these videos to be put into the computer, holograms are being created. Wait, wait, I, it sounds insane. But it's because the artificial intelligence is becoming so sophisticated that it will be possible, and it may be possible already, I know they're working on the models of these, where students can go into a room, bring up whichever survivor they want, and that survivor's hologram comes up as if they were there in 3D. And the student can say, where were you born? And the Holocaust- Sinish famia, man, sinish famia. I'm not saying good or bad, I'm not judging it. I'm, judging. I'm just saying it's unbelievable to think that in a generation from now, it will be possible for groups of students to sit in a room with a hologram of a Holocaust survivor who can answer all their questions and tell the story seamlessly. <laughs> okay, well, but why, El? Tell me why. Many reasons. Many Go reasons. Ahead. I'll tell you, I'll tell I'll start with first of all, these people agreed to give their testimonies by video and audio to the Shoah Foundation or to the uh, Yale University archives. They did not agree to be a hologram. They did not agree. I mean, they, they you know, it's like, it's like looking on a dead person who has not given you permission to look on them. 
Okay. To me, to me, I, yeah. I mean, it's just too bad that they didn't get the rights for the hologram. And a hologram is not real, even though it looks real. And you shouldn't think, in my opinion, listen, I'm such a tight ass. I'm such a hard ass person. No, it's, I get it. I mean, I get it. that you shouldn't imagine, like, do you think that that's a real, you know, so you think that you're actually talking to a real person? No. Did you, you see them? What do you learn from them that you don't learn looking at a video of of their what what do you get from a hologram interaction? It's not real. I mean, I just don't get it. But it is it, well, you know, it's interesting. And again, I could see both sides of this coin. I could argue both sides of this argument because it is their words, it is their voice, and nobody is saying they're alive. People are being known that these people died, they lived, they died, they experienced these things, and the future technology, or actually today's technology, allows them to answer questions. Make them a robot. Them. Let's make them a robot and, and they can do what they did in life. So let's true. say cook for you <laughs> and they'll wash the floor and tell you what it was like. At least so, they'll do something. You know, I'm looking at the comments on Facebook. So one person says the hol holograms are giving me the creeps. And then somebody else says, I saw this on 60 Minutes. It was amazing. And then other people are saying only person to person. And other persons say, I prefer for you to write and act the stories out much more Absolutely. human. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. again, I'm not suggesting one or the other, but I got news for you. Whether we like it or not at this point, that's the future. That's happening now. Yeah, okay, Zolzine. I mean, I you know, the future is the future. I won't be here in the future. And now I'm I'm determined that in my will, I'm going to say that I do not permit being Bye. a hologram, right. a Holocaust hologram. It's like a TV show, the Holocaust holograms, Sinish Famia. And, yeah. and if I don't put this in my will, because it's going to cost me to call my lawyer, I'm making this announcement on Facebook and on no hologram, too. no Eleanor Risa hologram. Okay. I will, I will, well, I won't be around. So, you, you know, who knows? Whoever's <laughs> around, please note. Right. Wow. 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 Anyway, we are going to have this conversation and much more tonight at nine o'clock. So, um, Eleanor, what else? What's not before we I, I just will say, here. you know, now in on my clock, it says 550 Eastern Standard Time. I'm just going to do right. a quick plug for 7 p.m. The rebroadcast of The Last Survivor. Uh, if you haven't seen it or you did tell your friends it's quite the actors are so good and i'm mm. it, it, it's quite wonderful so it's a different thing than than this today and i thank you avi and okay. yiddish kite initiative so much of course of course of course um yes let me reiterate but first let me thank eleanor risa who is not only my dear dear friend and I'm a hologram. Just think of me as a hologram. In case you didn't know, Eleanor Hologram Risa is um, someone who is so important in this world of Yiddishkeit. The work she's done, whether it's as a writer, as a, an actor, a director, a singer, she is one of the not so many in the world today who understand the truth and the realities of all of these things we're talking about when it comes to Yiddishkeit. She is what we say in Yiddish, von unsere. She's one of ours. She really understands Yiddish and the Yiddish language, Yiddish culture. She understands, you know, the Holocaust experience as a 2G, just like I do. And, and there aren't that many of us. You know, there are more, of course, but sooner or later will be gone. And then it goes to the three Gs um, and the four Gs and others. Um, and those are the things we're going to talk about. So, Eleanor, thank you. I'm going to turn off your video for a, for a little while. You thank don't you, have Abby, to go and Thank away. you to the audience. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Um, and I would like to once again thank our sponsors, thank everyone who is watching right now and everybody who's going to watch in the future. Yeah.